What's up, Bills fans? Welcome into our look ahead episode of Shout at Buffalo Bills football podcast. We get back into some AFC East football this week and uh, your favorite, the New England Patriots are up next. Um, and Shout, as always, is brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets. Are you ready for Slider Sunday? Every time you visit slidersunday.com, you have a chance to win free products, brand swag, tailgating gear, trips, and more. Um, Visit the Tops Deli section and look for the bright orange Kings Hawaiian displays. Scan the QR for a chance to instantly win tailgating prizes this season. And then visit topsmarkets.com slash slider Sunday for slider recipes. My friend Andrew Callahan is in the house today from the Boston Herald. It's good to chop it up with you, my friend. How are you? It's great to see you. Pat's bills, uh, usually a little predictable, but our chats are not. So this will probably be more fun than what we see on Sunday. (laughs) Dude, it's been a tough go at it uh, this year uh, for the Patriots, looking through things, going back and watching a couple of their games. I mean, 30,000 foot view, you know, where do things sit after six weeks versus what your expectations maybe were coming into the season? Yeah, it's it's a worst case scenario here in New England. And I think I speak for every media member who might have been a little more down on them than I was. I thought this would be a nine and eight football team. Um, fighting for a wild card spot, wasn't sure if they would get there. You, know, you have Bill O'Brien who came in, um, could bring in some elements of the offense that obviously worked for Mac Jones at Alabama, where Bill O'Brien had been the last couple of years. Um, and it just hasn't happened because the offensive line is the worst in the league. They have the least explosive personnel group outside. Juju Smith-Schuster was damaged goods when they signed him. And so you basically lost to Kobe Myers for nothing. And they've had a number of injuries. Like defensively, they lost their only blue chip players in Matthew Juna and Christian Gonzalez when they lost to the Cowboys. So you could, you know, if you're looking on the sunny side, say one in five is really just a combination of bad luck and one possession, you know, games that didn't go your way and all these injuries. But the truth is their point differential and their penalties and their turnovers tell a different story. This is a one in five football team that deserves to be a one in five football team. Mm-hmm. Let's get into Mac Jones a little bit because obviously – even from outside New England, you start to see the chatter about a potential change to quarterback Malik Cunningham, uh, an exciting prospect from the summer, uh, kind of getting maybe back in the mix there. What's up with Mac? Because we seem so far removed from some of the good things that I think a lot of people on the beat there were seeing his rookie season. You know, I went back and watched uh, this last week's game against the uh, Raiders, which, you know, Max Crosby's a really good player, but some of the throws just completely um, nonsensical. The interception uh, against the, the New Orleans Saints uh, two weeks ago. What's up with Mac? So what's up with Mac is a question we've been asking for the last year and a half. Really, I mean, since they they lost that wild card game in, in Buffalo. And for him, you know, he's a highly – dependent quarterback when it comes to his environment and look that's true of the position right like no quarterback is throwing blocks no quarterback is catching his own passes you know taking the ball when he's handing it off I mean maybe Josh Allen can do some of those things I don't know I haven't given it uh, taking a dive into my Bills film but he's a pocket bound point guard and so when you can't protect him he falls apart when receivers can't get open he can't extend plays and the arm talent isn't such that okay he's a statuesque passer but he can you know really fling it in there or downfield so defenses have adjusted to this the patriots have not surrounded him with players but on his end he's committing the worst possible mistakes and the difference in the first 3 games was mac was a better player under pressure than we saw a year ago when he got spooked at the first sign of any kind of incoming rusher off the edge or up the middle you know it it was the worst quarterback in the league according to PFF when he was under pressure that changed the first three weeks. But in the last three weeks, he's reverted back to that 2022 version, which had a bad offensive line, not as bad as this one. And of course, skill group players that weren't as good as he had in 2021. So the system has changed now. Third coordinator in three years, third quarterbacks coach in three years, third offensive line coach in three years. And Mac hasn't been able to overcome those circumstances because that's not the player that he is. Mm hmm. You mentioned the offensive line at the top and the struggles uh, that they've had this season. You look at the game against uh, the Raiders last week, uh, per PFF, three uh, sacks allowed, um, seven total pressures. They're going to go up against the Bills defensive line this week. That is, you know, I, I'm not surprised that they're among the, the league's best when it comes to causing pressure and sacks. I mean, there's a lot of talent. It's a deep unit, but I don't think – they were on the radar really nationally in terms of a group that was going to be this good without Von Miller, especially. 
So I'm wondering matchup wise in this game, where are the real deficiencies on this offensive line? And where do you see maybe the bills uh, can maybe take advantage? <laughs> it's pretty much everywhere except for left tackle and center and and left tackle of course is still Trent Brown as you know we wrote a long story about the downfall of Mac Jones with my colleague Doug Kai Knight the Herald and speaking to one front office executive it was it was running down what he thought the Patriots had personnel wise and offense he goes they signed Trent Brown and pay him because nobody else wants to and yet mm -hmm. Trent Brown that guy has been their best offensive lineman and he's played well I mean he's 6'8 380 pounds but when you can just avoid him and David Andrews is a fine center, always been, you know, kind of a B, B minus player. You have two rookies at guard. You have a right tackle, Vidarian Lowe, they traded for, you know, a couple weeks before the season uh, and has allowed 18 pressures alone in five games, according to my charting, and gave up, you know, a half sack to Max Crosby, which is really no big knock, right? Like Max Crosby right. is a beast. But, you know, they can create matchups. They can just run four Vegas blitz just three times against them. And Mac was getting the ball out in 2.2 seconds. So, I would expect a similar game plan from New England because they know they have matchup problems at three of the five spots on the offensive line. And it doesn't matter who they rotate in uh, or play because there's just two players on this offensive line that are starting caliber and healthy right now. And they might get Mike on one back at right guard. He was an emergency uh, player because he's dealing with an ankle injury and he was on, he was uh, available on the game day, but, but didn't play, you know, that's three, but he's not played like himself all season. So that's, you guys can kind of pick your spots and go to <laughs> go to town. Wow. Um, Ezekiel Elliott, when you, when he kind of hung out there in free agency this offseason after the Cowboys released him, a lot of Bills fans, you know, were asking, what about Ezekiel Elliott? And I was kind of like, I was really lukewarm on the idea because I thought that his best football was behind him. But I've actually been impressed with him. I mean, he looks like he's got more juice than he has in a couple of years. What have you noticed from him? And I know that that offense has struggled a lot, but he seems like maybe a, a bright spot in there. Yeah, I would say so. You know, when you're scoring 12 points a game, um, there aren't many, but they have found something in Zeke that they have a player they trust. And I think that's the biggest thing. Consistently, you know, you understand Zeke is going to be good in short yardage, scored a two-yard touchdown against the Raiders on a direct snap. Their first in, I think it was 39 drives uh, on Sunday. And you, he knows what he's doing in blitz pickup. I think that was like every commentator and analyst favorite fun fact about Zeke is, oh, you know how good he is in pass protection. Like, yes, it's been true since he was at Ohio State. And so what they do is rotating him with Ramondre Stevenson almost every other drive. Um, sometimes Stevenson will get two in a row. And mm -hmm. if they go, you know, seven or more plays in a drive, they'll switch out because they feel comfortable, you know, with that. A veteran who understands everything they want to do schematically. A veteran who can catch the ball out of the backfield. He's not going to make you miss. But – He's reliable in that sense for they're so low on those kind of players that when they signed him, they had a role for him and he really filled a need because they were banking on some young backs to develop and come through in training camp and it just didn't happen. Um, let's take a quick break here. If you want uh, a little extra glimpse into the Bills locker room and uh, a special version of Bills coverage, join the uh, Shout Insider text line right now, 716 528-6727. The Shout text line is brought to you by Carrie C. Byer, attorney with the law offices of Francis M. Litro, located at 237 Main Street, Buffalo, New York. If you or someone you know is seriously injured, give him a call at 716-852-1234. All right, let's uh I want to get into the defense a little bit before I let you go, but I want to talk about Bill Belichick. I mean, I I've always um found it interesting uh for all you guys out there on the beat and what it's like to kind of cover him. What's he been like? Because I I feel like this has been, he's never been more doubted nationally. I mean, the conversation is now starting to bubble about, is he on the hot seat? Can the Patriots possibly consider firing him? What are, what's the status? What's, what's it like covering Bill uh, on the daily right now? So it's funny, like they're one and five, as I said, you're a Zach Wilson Hill Mary away from being 0 and six. And it sounds very doom and gloom. Like they had two close games against the Eagles and Dolphins. And you're like, okay, this is the team I thought could hang with most in the league and they're doing it. And then it's just all falling apart since then. But during that time, Bill has been built. I mean, well, with the media, according to the players behind the scenes, according to the people I text that are not in the locker room, but other parts of the organization, things are a little bit more dour, but that's kind of Belichick's default <laughs> mode anyway. So for the long-term view of this season, I expect this to be Belichick's last season. And there's much to do with, you know, them coaching out of a 10-0 or 13-3 hole like we saw Sunday, every single game virtually, dating back to last Thanksgiving 
And so you can't win games like that. And that speaks to preparedness, speaks to your message of getting across. And they've allowed an opening drive score on four of their six games so far. So this isn't just an offensive issue. This is defensively. And with Belichick, he's, of course, the GM here as well. And again, the roster, I said at the top, worst offensive line in football, least explosive skill position group, minimal blue chip players as a whole. It's a bummer for them. Two of them got injured in Gonzalez and Judon. You just can't live life like that in the NFL. You need more of that talent and to pay for it, which they haven't done in recent off seasons or move up in the draft to secure players where that's the only place you're really going to get them uh, reliably year after year. So it's, it's not been all that different on the outside, excuse me, on the inside, but you know, they're aware of the situation they're in. I know he is. And it's at this point, I think everyone's going to play it out. I, I would be surprised if they fire him mid season, because I think, Robert Kraft understands what Belichick has done for him the last 24 years. Best franchise in football, maybe the best team in NFL history. Certainly the best 20-year run, six Super Bowls and all that. So you just let him play it out and give him the chance to, hey, are we going to call this a resignation? Or are we going to call this a firing? It's your call. Mm -hmm. um, defensively, you mentioned you know some deficiencies there. Let's start on the defensive line. And with Matthew Judon now gone, you look at a young player like Josh Uche, as maybe somebody that could step up into a larger role. What have you seen from him throughout this season? And who is that? If you were to find one um, consistent performer on that line, when it comes to the pass rush, who do you, who has it been through six weeks? Man, it's tough. Cause I, I was just writing my film review today that their pass rush has not hit a 25% pressure rate, you know, which I like to keep these numbers too, because we all use PFF. I just think it's a little more inconsistent than, than what I see with my own eye, but they haven't gotten to a 25% pressure rate three weeks. They have two sacks in the last two games. So Uche does have that natural talent, but he's a player who's only playing about a third of their snaps. They don't trust him on early downs, which limits, you know, of course your opportunity to get sacks against play action or maybe some quick game that goes wrong when teams are passing a first and 10 or second and medium. So a guy like Christian Barmore is another one kind of has the talent, you know, a defensive call dealt with injuries in the first two seasons, hasn't quite developed, but he gets that push that doesn't show up as a quarterback hit or a sack just kind of moves guys off of his spot. Um, but they're trying to scheme this up right now. And against Josh McDaniels and the Raiders, you know, their their schemes didn't get through. Again, the, the Raiders didn't allow a sack. They had two against the Saints. One was a covered sack. So there's really not that player. That player was Matthew Judon, who also forget just kind of winning his his pass rush reps because he wasn't even in the top 40 or 50, according to PFF, when it came to pass rush win rate. What he would do is tilt the protection when, you know, teams would know Judon's on the left and they would learn early, okay, they're chipping you with a running back or they're sliding in pass protection to the left, you know, and then they would manipulate that with a rush on the other side where, you know, the opposing offensive line would be outnumbered in some sort of blitz. So they would drop Matt Judon in the face of a double team. They can't do that anymore. Teams are just comfortable playing them one-on-one. -on -one. And so they're left just kind of trying to win in other ways. And when Uche has a down game, like he did against Vegas, zero pressures, according to my charting, um, they're, they're in a tough spot. Mm-hmm. Um, at the linebacking um, spot, obviously everybody's familiar with Bentley. Jelani Tavai, uh, tell me a little bit about him because it, it just you mentioned PFF. Uh, obviously, he's graded out pretty highly last week and, and over the course of the season. What does he do well, um, and how much juice has, has he brought to their defense? Yeah, so I'm I'm glad you brought him up because he's become kind of a pinata for the fan base. You know, he signed. Mm -hmm. When Matt Patricia had come back and was, you know, all that stuff that went on to Detroit and everyone's like, oh, he's got the Patricia stink to him. Why do you sign him? It's just Patricia and Belichick's year. Doesn't play a lot in 21. Last year was pretty good. They gave him an extension in the middle of the season. It was cheap. People still freak out. I'm like, this is 2% of the cap. This doesn't really matter. He's a guy who can play off the ball and on the edge. And that's valuable for a defense to be as multiple as they are. And a defense that needs to be as multiple as it can be. Because you just can't win one-on-one -on -one with talent in a way that, you know, the Bills might were just, hey, here's our front four. Good luck blocking us. The Patriots don't have those players. And so when they lose Matt Judon a couple of weeks ago, and they lose Keon White to a concussion as they did in Vegas, they had him drop onto the edge. And he set a sturdy edge like you would ask any defensive end. Did a really good job. And the Raiders aren't a good rushing offense. They might be worse in the league. But Josh Jacobs is still a good back. And Jelani Tavai helped limit that. What he also did uh, was get a quarterback hit and had to run stuff. So it's a lot of dirty work for him. There's not like a lot of juice. You know, he collected a, a uh, an interception that Jabril Peppers caused by popping Devontae Adams in like a hit that I thought shook the sphere on the opposite side of Vegas. Like this was one of the best hits you're going to see all year. But he's just a guy who's been almost like a glue guy. He's unspectacular. He's solid. And again, 
those are the guys they need, especially when they're dealing with the injuries that they are. Um, I'm not surprised that they traded for JC Jackson only because when Gonzalez went down, you know, you need somebody right to put in there and there's familiarity with the player. Um, I thought like toward the end of his run in the bills matchup specifically, and you know, a lot of people struggle against Stefan Diggs. you know, that just the, the contract that he got, it never really felt good to me. Like if I was that team's fan base, giving him all that money, um, and, and obviously didn't go well for him in LA Getting him back, what's the idea around that? And how have you seen him kind of assimilate back into things in the first few weeks? Yeah, so again, this goes back to the injuries. You not only lose Christian Gonzalez, but Jonathan Jones missed four game. Marcus Jones looks like he's out for the year. And Jack Jones has been on IR, you know, since week one. So those are your top four cornerbacks that for most of the season have just been out. And, that, and that's just bad luck. You know, say what you will about the Patriots rivaling in other senses. Cornerback was fine as long as Gonzalez came through. He did. And then he got hurt. So J.C. Jackson is someone that, you know, in his own words, 100 percent in L.A. That was excuse making. But I don't see the same kind of burst. I don't say he's lost a full step, maybe a half step. Third. Do we do third steps, um, you know, in New England? But he played 96 percent of their snaps against the Raiders, 67. He only missed one uh, or two, I believe. And that was second most behind only Juwan Bentley. So they see him as healthy enough or better than all of their other players and we'll take 80 percent whatever it is of jc jackson and they played a little bit more man coverage it was still a, a two to one split between zone and man which is what they've had to do even as you know a defense that played more man coverage than virtually anyone else in the league going back two three years and so he's fine again he, i think with him you're trying to mitigate the gambles that sometimes pay off in a big way with big interceptions he had eight in his last full season in new england had more from 2018 to 2022 um or to 2021, you know, in that span, four years, more, most in the NFL. But now you can't give those up on the on the downside of those gambles where you get burned on a double move or he jumps a route that doesn't develop the way he thought he would because that's a touchdown. Their offense isn't built to play from behind. So he's been fine. Again, it was more of a Band-Aid um, that, you know, the Chargers even paid most of that money for him to come back. So it was a, it was a worthy gamble. I just don't think it's going to be life-changing in any way for this defense. Um, Mac Jones in terms of this week and it, what happens down the road with, with a one and five team. I mean, it's, it's anybody's guess and you probably could figure out how that ends up playing out, but is there danger that if this doesn't go well this week, he gets pulled and they make a move to Cunningham. I wish I had that answer, man, <laughs> because it's just, you let's just start with the Vegas game. So there was a report that Mac was going to be on a short leash. And that was from Ian Rappaport, the NFL Network, who used to cover the Patriots, actually for the Boston Herald, and is, is tied in still with the Patriots. And, and his word is, is pretty much as solid as you'll find out there. Then the Patriots had zero backup quarterbacks in Mac Jones, except for Malik Cunningham, who has spent all year on the practice squad, was an undrafted rookie out of Louisville, who they said, we're going to move you to receiver. So they didn't have a backup quarterback against Vegas when he was supposedly on this short leash. And Mac had been benched the two prior weeks for turning the ball over. He throws a pick in the second quarter, continues to play, and then Malik Cunningham's three snaps under center were a zone read that he gave instead of pulling around the edge and would have had a long gain, a sack, and then him moving out wide so Ezekiel Elliott could take a direct snap for a two-yard touchdown. So I don't know what their plan was with Malik Cunningham. But as much as it's on Mac, it's also a reflection on Bailey Zappi, who they just flat out cut on cut down day back in late August and have since cycled through Matt Corral and he had book and now Will Greer who's on the roster because they're unhappy with him as their number two. So they don't really feel like they have a good number two option. Mac could get benched. He could get traded if Bill really wanted. I don't think you're getting anything for Mac Jones at this stage, but <clears throat> he's from people I've talked to Mac has largely lost the locker room. And so when your starting job is really only yours because no one else can take it, and the guys don't believe in you, and the coach has made his feelings clear based on the way he pulls you in games, like whether he gets benched or not, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just he needs to just hold on the ball, and that's it. Because that's that's the only thing they can really cling to an offense. And this sounds so bleak. Like, I'm glad this is a Bills podcast, and I'm sure people are smiling. I say this on mine, and they're frowning, and they're yelling at me. But this <laughs> is just the God-honest truth, and that's not from me. It's from people inside the building. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm not just saying this because you're on my podcast, but uh, the best Patriots coverage uh, for my money uh, in, no, in New England, man. You do a great job. Uh, let everybody know where they can find uh, your your work this week as they prepare for Sunday. 
Sure. So everything's going to be on, on X, Twitter, uh, at underscore Andrew Callahan here for me. Also the Pats, P-A-T-S, Interference Podcast, if you want to just listen to a bunch of mailbag questions from a lot of sad Patriots fans of people in Buffalo would love that, as they should. Uh, and then, you know, occasionally we'll find some videos uh, from when I do some work on TV with NBC Sports Boston. But everything you'll find at underscore Andrew Callahan on Twitter. Beautiful, man. See you this weekend. Yeah, thanks, buddy.